All right, I guess we'll get started. Thanks everybody for coming to Blockchain is Singing My Song. Mm -hmm. Blockchain tech for music distribution and rights and royalties. Uh, my name is Bruce Balanceifer. I am an independent music producer and program manager here in the Seattle area. Um, I've spent some time working at Storm, a local blockchain startup. I was the program uh, manager for the catalog platform at Rhapsody Napster for a small time. and. Uh, I uh, wanted to put this talk together with some of my uh, colleagues here from the local blockchain community because I think there's a really cool opportunity for uh, blockchain used in service to music and artists and their rights and their creations that are out there being used in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so let me introduce our panelists real quick. Um, to my left here we've got Tyler Boscolo. He's the current COO of LifeID, a blockchain solution uh, for identity that is here in Seattle. Um, he's ran marketing for Sky Movement, a company that hosted major live shows in the past, and he's a co-founder of a music-related blockchain project called Mobile um, that was interfacing with the, uh, the current companies there and trying to push uh, blockchain solutions for a lot of the accounting and reporting and middleman stuff, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So would you like to say anything about you, briefly? Um, yeah, sure. This is, this is really exciting. My, uh, my background, as Bruce mentioned, was doing marketing for really large-scale shows. Um, people like Chris Brown and, and Lil Wayne, these kind of you know, large artists that people are uh, super familiar with. And, and my interesting background was in the sense that I realized how big of a pain point there was from the royalty management side. And when I found out about blockchain, I said, this is the perfect marriage for the technology because it can solve a problem um, sort of by default in this industry. And so uh, I've been I'm spending the last year or so on the identity side, which is a really big component and a large problem. Um, and we also have a partner called Resonate, which is a music streaming platform on the blockchain. And so it's been interesting to get a bunch of different viewpoints of how all of these solutions can sort of play with one another and, and work together to be able to um, solve a really large problem. So I'm excited. Thanks for sending us up, Bruce. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about Resonate later, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Joshua Duchesne. He's a composer, sound designer, educator, public speaker, all-around blockchain enthusiast, mm -hmm. media guy. Um, he's a contributor to Giveth.io, which is really interesting. It's a decentralized, altruistic community on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell a little bit about that, Josh? Yeah, um, so first, my audio and music background. Um, I, I come from the world of, of bands and musicians, and then the last handful of years have worked uh, in video games and VR um, on the audio side of things. Um, but uh, specifically from the, the music world, as a musician and performer, and uh, regularly appearing on a multitude of different soundtracks for other artists as a contracted performer, um, getting royalties is such a pain. Like you, I I know I know there's like so much money floating out there that I will never see just because the tracking is so difficult and uh, the timeliness. It, there's no timeliness in this. Like it's it's years and years sometimes before you get paid. So there's just so many things the blockchain can contribute to this um, that I'm super stoked on. And as yeah. for as for Giveth, um, it's more of an it's not really related to audio necessarily. Um, but it's a we're we're a platform that's trying to re-engineer the way that uh, charitable donations work um, using blockchain as the tool to ensure accountability and transparency um, and efficiency uh, in the process so that we can disintermediate the entire thing take out the bureaucratic hierarchical organizations that sit in between a donor and a doer and a recipient um, and let code handle all of that work uh, for free in an open source project so that money goes directly from donor to the recipient and that's, that's what we're working on with that project. What's well, a similar uh, problem that we're solving here with music and uh, we're, music to listen to, right? Which actually overlays pretty well. We're solving the problem of, of money going directly from the from person to person, person, right? to person. exactly. Peer, so peer to peering peer all to of the peer. things. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so then we have Casey out in the end. We have Casey O'Neill, head, uh, head of audio and growth marketing also at um, Eight Circuit Studios. They're a video game uh, media company working in the blockchain space, actually. They're playing with blockchain tech. Um, he's previously worked for the Grammys, been marketing for small indie labels uh, before transitioning into tech. So, has done his fair share in tech and music as well. Indeed. Uh, my first job in tech was working for a tech company attempting to get into music. It was in 2009, and they built a, a storefront that would work in the Facebook newsfeed. And this was before Spotify even came to the US. So we actually had a working storefront that people could post in a news feed where you could buy music from. It's just we didn't we didn't execute on it properly, so <laughs> it didn't really go anywhere. <clears throat> wow. Cool. Um, so today I wanted to talk about 
blockchain music rights specifically. Um, I think a little introduction might be appropriate for anybody in the room who isn't intimately familiar already with the situation in the marketplace. Um, so right now, we have streaming, and it's been happening for about you know a dozen years. iTunes launched in 2001. Um, and we've been trying to figure out how to make, you know, as, a, as an industry, we've been trying to figure out how to make this music streaming thing work. Um, we have the technology to take a piece of music as a digital asset and deliver that to people via streaming. Um, but what hasn't seemed to evolve commensurately with that is the, all the middle business processes. It seems like we're having a lot of growing pain still 10, 12 years into the streaming thing with accounting that this song is owned by this person and that this play of this song is owed money to this person, right? Um, the current situation is still that we have these major stores and labels and publishers and performing rights organizations. All these actors are exchanging huge amounts of data via spreadsheets still sometimes and database extracts of these tens of thousands of song plays and trying to make sure that they can account for all this stuff every month. Um, it's resulting in unpaid royalties to artists, uh, litigation has resulted, you know, infamously uh, in a lot of these cases where entire groups of artists and their, their performing rights organizations who represent them, you know, have, have threatened suit or brought suit to these stores. Um, uh, and it seems like the situation is that stores often want to pay their royalties. Like they're in this business to do it properly and do it legally and fairly. But it's, it seems difficult for them a lot of the time to even know who to pay, where to send this money, like who was owed this money for royalties, because um, uh, there are so many parties involved in getting this content out to these people, right, and, and trying to get this money <coughs> where it goes. So uh, I think a, an explanation of the mechanism of streaming is, might be helpful. Um, so a record, a track that you listen to on a streaming service consists of three parts that we're concerned with, three conceptual components. There's the composition, which is the song as written, like the notes and music of the song as sort of a written work. So that's the composition. The master is the recording of that composition, the actual track that was produced by the music recording studio or the label and distributed. That's the one you hear on the radio. That's, yeah, that's the track you hear on the radio. That's the audio that was created of the composition. And there's the performance, which is uh, this recording, this master recording is a performance of that composition. It's just one performance of that composition. Um, if you take that composition, that song, and you perform it publicly on stage, that's a separate performance of said composition. So um, a lot of people don't realize that there are so many components to like just a music track that you're hearing. Um, so that means that this results in this complex web of data exchange and financial exchange where you have an artist who just wants their money for the track they made. You have performing rights organizations who are just trying to get the money that are owed to the people they represent and they interface with these stores. You have publishers who are trying to make sure that the composer of the work, which may be the recording artist or somebody else entirely, yeah. is getting their money for the, the, the work as embodied in that recording. Um, and so we've, we've got you know, a heck of a mess in our hands. Yeah, but... And I wanted to talk with you guys about how, how blockchain is, is promising to solve a lot of these sort of bureaucratic, logistical, like you mentioned, these hierarchical and just overcomplicated um, schemes of, of entities and, and data exchange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think one interesting place to start is that you mentioned that there's three sort of components to it, but within each of those components, there could be dozens of contributors per aspect. So you multiply yeah. that out, you take three, and then by 12, so you, there's a lot of people that are entitled to all of these rights, and then as you distribute them, it just becomes a whole mess and really complicated. So um, that's one of the first problems that it's, a lot of it has to do with identity, interestingly enough. And so how do you begin there? And we can, you know, that might, been, that might not be the best place to start, but we can sort of figure that out as we go along. But um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of challenges with it. Yeah, so b before we get too deep into how blockchain can help with this, I think it'd be helpful just to do a quick overview of what blockchain is for people that aren't already in that world. Um, I, I have a loose definition that I, that I give that isn't technical. Um, and I define it in four key parts. Uh, first, blockchain is a recently developed technological tool, so that's part of it. Uh, secondly, that uses a combination of uh, math, cryptography, computer science, and game theory. So these are sort of the elements that compose uh, blockchain um, that uh, solves long-standing problems that we, we previously weren't able to solve with our uh, prior tool sets. Uh, four, which enables us to do really cool things we've never before been able to do. So that's, the, that's my high-level uh, definition of blockchain. You can think of it as a tool, like the, the internet itself is a 
tool. It's a giant distributed decentralized tool and on top of it you can build things like the World Wide Web using a particular protocol. You can build uh, whatever protocol email uses is another type of protocol you can put on top of the internet and use it to do certain things and accomplish certain, uh, certain functions. Blockchain is the same sort of thing. It's a broad based tool that anybody can use um, and with it it enables us to do really cool things and it allows us to solve a lot of these problems because of the inherent properties of blockchain. Um, and that's I think, a nice little intro into how, how we're going to use it to solve things. So, yeah. um, so one, one thing that, uh, that we talked about here was distributing all these payments to different people. Um, one nice thing that we've developed through blockchain is this thing called smart contracts. Uh, yeah. It's essentially an unchangeable piece of code that executes a specific function when certain conditions are met. Uh, so with these these code-based contracts within with within a music track itself You could have a smart contract attached that would have the names and Basically wallets or the money addresses of all the people involved and the percentage breakdown of everything they receive So as soon as a song is played Instantly the exact percentage each person is owed could be sent to them that moment Or if it's counting at the end of the day it could be that day, but it doesn't take months or weeks or sometimes years for a payment to get processed, you could literally wake up the next morning and you would see, here's the 17 cents I made from the 0.15% uh, I'm, I'm owed for the composition of the drum part of this one track that was played at this one location. That You'd have all that information built into uh, any of these smart contracts. So you'd be receiving money instantly and everybody would be paid out quickly without all these, all these problems and middlemen in the middle sucking a lot of that funds. That's perfect segue. I was getting right yeah. to smart contract next. Yeah, you nailed awesome, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Casey, I think that there are um, similar concerns in the area of Eight Circuits work where you're dealing with audio assets, maybe not music tracks, mm -hmm. but there's a similar need to kind of understand that this asset, this piece of audio, uh, has an origin <clears throat> and that needs to be tracked and that mm -hmm. needs to be respected through the whole pipeline, right? Yeah, so the way that we're not looking at it from an audio standpoint, so mm. the assets that we're using are actually in-game assets. Oh, sure. but, mm. but from a, uh, and I can get into that later, but the, from an audio standpoint, I think another thing that's really important is if you combine what you were talking about with identity, and then what you were just talking about is you can actually digitally identify the song and can point it to the owner. And that way, the owner of the song will always be attributed to that. Mm. Um, in this day and age, you know, if you have, a, the example I always use is, if you've got a photo on your phone, you can send that photo to anybody. It's always the same file. But if you have uh, a file that is sent from a smart contract, it is always going to be the same, same or the same file from, trying not to get too technical on it, but <laughs> there's a hash function involved. The hash function, if it's changed, it's not the same file. So there is a lot of digital attribution that can be assigned to music too. So, so I think the key there is that we can we can enforce something like uniqueness or digital scarcity using this technology mm -hmm. because every um, the way that blockchain works, if you're unfamiliar, is that every transaction that happens, if there's an event like I've played this song, what happens is that that gets recorded and added to the chain mm -hmm. as a new block, right? So it's basically a ledger of transactions through time uh, where this song was created and then it was played by this user, played by this user, played by this user. Um, and what's neat about it is that the way that this hash, hash crypto component works is that each of those events is enforced to be unique mathematically so that um, this is kind of revolutionary this is really hard to overstate that we can actually in a way create digitally scarce objects now mm -hmm. right so like the whole crypto kitties thing that that became so popular was about making each of these kitties unique because they can only be created once cryptographically wrapped in this hash function that can only exist once uniquely. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's that's really interesting. And it all starts, uh, I think this is a good time to say that, okay, so we know um, what piece of content this is, but even backing up further, you mentioned earlier the identity piece is going to sure. be like where this all starts. So right. I, I think that... Um, as these blockchain projects are starting, we see things like MusicCoin and Resonate Co-op, and there are actually solutions that are out there. Um, but it seems that one challenge to me is interoperability, mm -hmm. where how do we know that artist A, who exists in the MusicCoin sphere, <coughs> has collaborated with artist B, who exists in Resonate's sphere? Do we have these artists as entities on both sides or in some universal common system where we can actually, no matter who works with who in this industry, attribute the work to those 
identities, have those identities exist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's certainly the the opportunity to be able to do that, which is why it, it, it's interesting that the fundamental base in this is actually an identity problem. Um, and as, as Bruce was alluding to, there is this challenge when you're uh, in, you know, an artist that has music on Apple and Spotify, just the common names that everyone knows. Um, how do you attribute people that are, are also supposed to be associated with a type of royalty payment. And so having a universal identifier that can sort of live um, outside of the particular ecosystem is really important. Um, and so that's you know, great, a great example in the case of where if we're working with Resonate, how do we ensure that that artist can also sort of duplicate what they're doing and have it be the exact same component on another platform? Um, and that's absolutely something that we can do with a blockchain-based identity solution. So I think there's there's great opportunity there for the peripheral tools around all this stuff to evolve as well, right? There's the core identity component. Um, there's the wallet. The wallet component of this is another big thing, I guess, right? Because mm -hmm. another hinge pin of this whole scheme is that is that we can digitally pay, you, that we have this currency, this cryptocurrency, this token, this something that represents value that we can send digitally to some address. Um, so that's the other major component here. There's one aspect I wanted to add on the on the unique identifier component, and this was actually something that got brought up in a conversation we had the other day. But there, one of the big issues when the internet came around with music and, and movies and a bunch of other um, digital assets was the like piracy and illegal downloading. And so one of the interesting things is that you can attribute a unique, a specific owner to it that if that asset finds itself without that unique identifier associated to it, you can know that it's pirated. And so it can allow services like YouTube, for example, to be able to more quickly shut down pirated um, work where they don't have access, or where they weren't supposed to have posted in the first place. And so there's some interesting things that extend a little bit further than just royalty management um, when it comes to these assets that the identity component can, can provide as well. So. Sure. And I think this, uh, another big uh, point of this is that this solution uh, is not only valid for music tracks. I mean, we could really extend this to anything media, yeah. right? So I think what's yeah. really compelling about this, this opportunity we have with this ledger technology is, is just, you can really uh, extend this to anything that's a creative work. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, authors, artists of any kind, um, mm -hmm. you know, composers, podcasters, anybody who really yeah. creates content, uh, should really be paying attention to this blockchain technology and the way that it can systematically enforce rights and just sort of uh, codify who's owed what, all mm -hmm. of this complex contract information. Contract is really the operative word, right? The yeah, smart yeah. contract thing can, can be extended to all of these areas. Yeah, definitely. Can I ask a question about the yeah. distribution of payments? Mm -hmm. So how hard is it to get the corporations involved that are collecting the money from the consumers to be able to convert that into cryptocurrency to distribute. Is there a is there like a corporate averse nature to trying to play in that realm with their their treasury money? Yeah, I actually wanted mm -hmm. to get in the second half yeah. uh, to some of the challenges that we're facing right now, and that's a good transition. Um, what we're seeing so far in the space, uh, in my research, is that so far the major players that exist have not jumped on board. You know. They're, they're not going to be the first ones into this new realm. Um, what is happening is there are platforms that are emerging uh, because developer enthusiasts are seeing this, this problem and they're agreeing that this is the solution. So mm -hmm. we're seeing projects, and I, I wanted to mention a few of them so we can actually talk about them right now. Can I add um, something real quick? Yeah. I yeah. think Spotify is Thank actually you. the only company that's jumped into it because they bought a company called Media Chain yeah. two or three <laughs> years point. ago. Um, and the founder of Media Chain is now part of A16Z's crypto fund. I don't know his yeah. name off the top of my head, but Media Chain was a pretty fascinating project. Yeah, it's still around. I don't know how Spotify is using it. Though. I wasn't able to find hmm. a lot of recent news on them. But yeah. I've heard. yeah. They got bought and all the news disappeared. I also don't know if they have, I think they're probably just a permission yeah. that doesn't have a crypto component to it, yeah, I, I would imagine. But That makes sense. Yeah, that, that is, I mean, just this idea in general. This is one thing that we talked about when we were communicating before is that it seems like right now there's these two worlds where there's your standard, you know, iTunes, Spotify, and whatever world where that's working just fine for them. Like iTunes has no desire to change what they're doing. They've got this behemoth system with a billion moving parts and it's working. And for most consumers, it's working. And for most artists, it's kind of working-ish enough that we haven't had to make a big fuss about it. Um, and then we have this other world of people who are kind of enthusiasts, people that understand the value of blockchain, 
musicians and artists that are getting behind this because they see the value of getting paid. They're interested in cryptocurrency for one reason or another, philosophically they're on board or something. Um, but there's currently this really strong divide where we don't see crossover and I don't expect us to really see a lot of crossover for a while. Um, and this is a challenge we're facing. Like, How do you develop a blockchain-based music platform that people want to use as much as iTunes, that is as easy to use, as simple, it comes on your phone when you buy it. Like, There's a lot of challenge, and we're gonna get to the challenges in a second, but mm -hmm. right now we have these two these two separate worlds. I think it's important as we go into this. To, to answer like, the question, is, yeah, these are emerging them. separately as, a, as sort of a grassroots thing so far. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, there, there are projects like, like Mobile that are trying to at least convince some of these players that there are efficiencies to be gained in a lot of the accounting and maybe, you know, the, the red tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, the the first place to go after has been the red tape with it with at least the major <clears throat> players where yeah. you know we can simplify this process somewhat we don't have to replace you entirely with a new platform right right yeah right yeah right do you want to speak to that a little bit Tyler yeah you know, what's it been like? I mean that frankly was really interesting that when we were having a lot of early conversations with potential customers and and trying to gather you know how do we build a uh, a feature set that solves problems for the current solution which was that. The, as soon as you introduce the crypto component, and I can speak to this, this is very true for most businesses. It's not unique to the you know, music industry, but in most cases, as soon as you bring in the crypto component, they're kinda, you kind of lose them. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> what we were trying to accomplish, what we are trying to accomplish, is that how can you provide a lot of the value that you can get through the automation, the immutability, so on and so forth, without introducing the complexity with the, the you know, tradable token on an exchange. And so there's ways that you can um, abstract that away from a, from a customer, which basically means that you have some sort of token economic model working underneath the hood, but it's set and it's not actually ever really touched Exposed by anybody. Yeah, exactly. And, and you can, yeah. and then from a business use case, you can say, okay, this can be attributed to X amount of dollars that is paid in USD or fiat, as we call it in the crypto space. Um, <laughs> so um, there's ways that you can accomplish that without having a publicly tradable token that some of the other music projects, they're going after the streaming solution is trying to accomplish. Um, so that was what we were trying, and you're exactly right, you know, solving immediate pain points with the red tape, with the accounting issues, rather than the... Challenging their core foundational sure, model. Yeah, right? yeah. Sure, <laughs> sure. Because, uh, you know, a lot of these, these ecosystems, they're run as fiefdoms, right? You have a label that has their artists, and they build a wall around those artists, and they have a gate, and if you want to get through that gate to those artists and their content, you pay this fee. And that's what it is for the year, Spotify. It's what it is, iTunes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Even and from the artist side, it's the same way. There's this, sure. there's this fiefdom, and you want to become a part of it because they're really good yeah. at what they do. Yeah, and which so is why you want to be on that label. Why you want to be on that label, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, there's got to be a way to keep kind of the the prestige or the, you know, the, <clears throat> the the top dogness of some of these, I guess, you know, labels, you know, yeah. not, like challenging it directly, but while yeah. building the new thing that, that will become increasingly appealing. So I think that's mm -hmm. what's most fascinating to me is that you have MusicCoin, you have Resonate, which is a co-op. So mm -hmm. you have all these different models that are emerging as entirely new ways to rethink the, the model of I'm an artist, I'm going to make music, and then I'm going to send it to people and somehow get paid yeah. um, that this technology is opening. Um, Resonate's a great example because that's yeah. a co-op model. Uh, I yeah. am a co-op member on Resonate because I uploaded one track as an artist, and that is your buy-in. That's your stake. You are a co-op member, that's and awesome. you can then vote every uh, every year on you know elections and things like this. And there's a whole oh, wow. governance structure and everything. Um, so that would never happen, right? Unless you had this kind of tech that that had yeah. could automatically account for all of the rights and royalties and plays right. and, and everything that's yeah. happening. Yeah, I mean, imagine Apple being like, hey, if you if you put a song on iTunes, you get to vote on how Apple runs its music business. Like, yeah, right. No, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> never, never happening. That wouldn't happen. No, it resonates, resonates a great example. So um, on the Life Eddy side, so we're partnering with them to provide the identity solution for, th they have this creative passport, which I won't go into because it's kind of a lengthy uh, conversation. But one of the things that they can, that they can do um, that's really interesting and challenging is that the one of the big problems in the blockchain space right now is the scalability component. So if you're running on a public ledger like Ethereum, for example, there's lots of problems that are introduced. It's really expensive and it's really slow. Um, and so one of the benefits that, our, that Resonate has, for example, is they're building on our chain, which is a local project here that can provide yeah. a lot of the scalability. And 
throughput. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out for them in the long term because they can be far more competitive when it comes to competing against the, you know, the Apples and the Spotify's of the world because they can actually sort of keep up because the technology on the back end is able to handle the transaction volume. Um, mm -hmm. So I think they've got, they got a lot of good stuff going. The guy running it's I'm super I'm really smart. interested in that project. Yeah. yeah. And so we've already touched on two of the major um, roadblocks or challenges that we're facing that I want to talk about. One was, you know, these existing players and their resistance to this open nature of these ledgers, right? Because mm -hmm. As blockchain uh, has been implemented in, say, Bitcoin, as a great example, you know, that has been just set up as a public ledger. So this is a good thing to talk about, is mm -hmm. that a lot of these fiefdoms, right, these labels, these publisher collectives, the, uh, you know, they, they want to control that content. They don't necessarily want everybody who's participating in this platform to know that this track is Rihanna's and she's making, you know, X dollars every time you play it or whatever. But that she didn't write any of and all, songs. But, like, but that there were 10 other people who actually yeah, wrote the composition that, behind that it. Max and, Martin has written most of your pop hits over the past decade. Or for anyone to know, say that Sony actually charged this store this much for access to their yeah, catalog this yeah. year. Or this is like kind of the rate that they're paying on their royalties when these streams happen. So yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, you guys have any thoughts about that? I mean, I think that we might see things like permission chains that happen first, where, where there's maybe there's a Sony chain. They see mm -hmm. Sony's, for example, they're the big dog right now for music, yeah. right? So if they finally see the appeal of, of taking care of a lot of red tape and, and the, the accounting that we talked about, mm -hmm. um, perhaps what happens is that there is a Sony BMG private permission chain that exists. Uh, and yeah. then when you are a streaming service and you want access to that catalog on that platform, you pay your access fee for, for permission. You get your credentials to the chain. And then your business systems have credentials to interact with that on an ongoing basis. By the way, does everyone yeah. sort of know the difference between a public ledger and a permission? Is that like, do we want to explain it's that? Just, yeah, yeah. Do I, you want to explain? I, I, go, go, go for it, it. Josh. I just, I just assume that this is, I mean, this is kind of a general-ish audience. Is that right? Not, not everybody here is in blockchain, right? Cool. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, we have music folks here. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Cool. Yeah, good. I mean, someone wanted to. Go ahead, you do it. All right, yeah, so I mean, okay, so so a public chain, um, that's like like, uh, like Bruce was saying, Bitcoin. That is something that is publicly accessible. Um, anybody can jump on and, and be a part of that chain as a miner or transact on that chain. You can see all of the transactions on this public digital ledger. Totally open. Yeah, totally open. You, you could go online right now on your phone onto a block explorer and you can see all the different transactions happening in real time from the history all the way back to the very first transaction. Um, a private ledger would be something held within private companies or corporations or between companies. And so it has some of the functionality of a blockchain except the public part of it. So they're not gonna show you what's happening on that chain. They're just getting some of the other benefits of it. Um, they might show you part of it. Um, it might be like partly public or it might be completely private. Um, but basically that's what a Sony would use so that you don't see who's getting paid what, who wrote what. You wouldn't see all that cool stuff, but they would be maybe using the tool as a way to, uh, to make the process easier for them. Um, without showing everybody, so would yeah. that be like Quorum, JP Morgan's blockchain? Yeah, like IP, mm -hmm. uh, IBM's yeah. Hyperledger. IBM Hyperledger. It's probably the best example. Yeah. Um, and so those those node operators, the, the, the computers that run the transactions, are determined by the company in this case, IBM, rather mm -hmm. than with Ethereum, anybody can just spin up a node and you can sort of participate within the economics. Yeah, join the pool. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Take transactions. Um, and so you know that was. I think what we'll see with the large enterprises, at least, they probably won't adopt public chain. This is my own perspective. I think that they yeah. will be far more um, quick to jump onto the permission private chain just because they can get some of the, the, the benefits that blockchain can offer, but they don't want to have all of their stuff out. I mean, it, it's not actually yeah. on the blockchain. Like, the information isn't per se on the chain, but it's, um, it's just, you know, shades of comfortability that they can, they can sort of accept. They can yeah. control it easier to exactly mm -hmm. and it's far less expensive yeah so. yeah. <laughs> yeah cool um so let me see another uh thing i wanted to talk about here was um interoperability yeah, yeah so let's assume that we do see something like a uh, sony bmg private permission chain where they've realized this efficiency but they don't want every all the information out there in public um one cool thing that's afforded us by this technology could be the standards that are emerging. Um, so the idea of a token standard, um, you may have heard of ERC-20 is the most popular standard being used right now in the, in the uh, blockchain space to build other applications on top of. So what this is, it's a protocol um, upon which, um, similar to the way that Josh was explaining the internet, 
On top of internet, you can put email, you can put World Wide Web, you can put these things. So on top of this ERC20 standard, you can put a music streaming solution. You can put a video, like the new YouTube. There's, you know, there's DJ yeah, and all stuff yeah. outside. But that's, where, but that's like, built on Steam. There, yeah, but yeah, right? same same idea. So you can you can distribute basically you know anything you want on top of this. Um, but what's neat about that is that anything else, any other project that wants to implement that ERC twenty standard, you could have various levels of interoperability between those two projects. So mm -hmm. what would be really cool is if this Sony BMG chain ended up being like ERC twenty compliant, mm -hmm. and then could actually exchange some amount of data, at least track titles and and ownership and rights info between say that platform and you know YouTube when the video for that music plays for yeah, example yeah, yeah. or taking that track and doing a remix of it and making a derivative work on mm -hmm. some other platform yeah 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 that's cool because right, right now isn't it that YouTube has like it's basically shazamming every single thing <laughs> that's played and then it tests if it matches against yeah. something and that's how they determine if you're copyrighted they're like oh, audio really? printing yeah it's like reviewing wow. content yeah. Yeah. like that wow. seems it seems so archaic when you look at the type of tech here that like you could literally just be like, well, they're, they're, the smart contract says this wallet address, we know it's that person, or it says this hash, or like it's all totally identifiable instantly without some weird like audio analysis going on. Yeah. If, if you wanted to get deeper, you could go into ERC-721 tokens, which mm -hmm. is what CryptoKitties was built on top of. Non-fungible. And they, uh, yeah, they're non-fungible tokens, so you can't, um, can't copy them for the most part. And I think, I think a combination of ERC-20 and ERC-721 would be an interesting yeah, to combat that type of thing. To to clarify the ERC seven twenty one because this is like, we're, we're we're like nerd talking so hard up here. So okay, so like so okay, think think of think of like a you 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 have a signed Michael Jordan basketball card. It's the only one. That's an ERC seven twenty one token. There's no other one like it in the world. If somebody else has that same Michael Jordan card and it's signed a second time, that signature is actually slightly different than the first one. Every one of those is a unique card with this unique identity and through cryptography and seven and ERC seven twenty one um, uh, tokens you can basically represent that that digital uniqueness uh, all all just digitally. So the idea of CryptoKitties, this was a this is a co like collectible cat game on the Ethereum platform. This was one of the one of the first big use cases of ER721 tokens Shockingly. where you have right where you, where you, you get your kitty page, man. You and and your kitty is is 100% unique. There's no other kitty in the entire uh, crypto kitty universe that has the exact same attributes and traits of your kitty. And if I traded my my fro kitty with a <laughs> sorry with 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 a with Bruce's nice clean cut kitty uh, we would then I would then have a clean cut kitty and you have the fro kitty and they would be the exact yeah. same the kitty, same fro kitty and the same, same fro kitty yeah. and the same, it, it wouldn't be like if I gave a him a dollar of. and he gave me a dollar we can spend that dollar at the grocery store and get the exact same thing it's not yeah. that but that that's fungibility fungibility means that there's no uniqueness these to two the things thing. are interchangeable interchangeable or, right? yeah so year 721 gives us a lot of a lot of really cool really cool things we can do can I ask you a question? I don't come from the music industry at all, but one thing I'm thinking about is like remakes of songs. So I get like sampling, like mm -hmm. you can take that, like kind of track it it's from its it. original mm -hmm. to like a shortened version. Mm -hmm. But how does it work with like relating a composition to somebody that just kind of takes that and then makes a new file with a new hash that's the same song? But does that make sense? No, it's, mm -hmm. that's a great question. I think yeah. that's one of the challenges that's being solved right now. Um, in my research so far, the state of the art is that we can set up a platform that will stream songs to listeners and pay the artists. Um, I think there are projects that exist very nascent that are looking at things like remixes, and I think that's the next big opportunity, and we can talk about that a bit. Is mm -hmm. I think derivative works are the next thing that we need to figure out. Um, but to your point, I would say that that would work if we could track the composition to composition level uniquely using this yeah. tech. Yeah. Um, so that it would be a different recording of the same composition that has some unique ID that's persisted through that chain, right? Yeah. So that we would know oh, that. Um, <laughs> I was just like, no, yeah, the, the, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just thinking like, if your if your DAW had like had had the smart contract detection, and as you pull tracks into your DAW, it's like automatically sourcing yeah, those hashes are those. coming in with those assets. And then like, and, like depending on how much you anything. trim, it's like okay, 1.7 percent of this song was used in your remix. Oh my, and can wow. that, like, <laughs> yeah. within your audio workstation. Oh my, it'd be so dope. That would be awesome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, like, two things on that note. Um, number one, that strikes me kind of as like an audio version of what Lip Lateral is doing with provenance. 
right? Yeah, yeah. Which is more difficult with audio files because there's nothing physical or visible in front of you. Yeah, so I don't totally. know how to do that. Hmm. But I would say that what somebody like Look Lateral is doing is maybe like a good place to start figuring out how exactly cool, to approach check that. that. Yeah. The other thing yeah, that's, that's more concerning right now is, again, kind of on your point, is let's say you make a non-fungible track, right? Like, I don't know, Enter Sandman. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and you go into that and you change, and so now you have locked in this is what the track is. Now somebody goes into that and changes one note, hmm. right? Which, from a listener's point of view, is probably next to negligible. They right. don't notice it, but it's not the same track. It's yeah, different yeah. by one note. Yeah. So what if you get like a 51% attack on the song? Which means that now you have a bunch of files that have that one note different, which uh, aren't the fungible to non fungible. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? We went from here just to like, oh, all man. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Oh, that's, that's awesome, dude. Down. That is cool. Yeah. Cool, but that's <laughs> No, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, how would you go? And again, I, I don't know yeah. what the answer to that question is, but like, where would you even start figuring out how to address that issue? Right. If anyone has a good answer for that, let us know, and we'll we'll, we'll make a platform yeah, we'll that solves that it and make a lot yeah, of freaking money. Private chain, though, you're not going to have the motivation for a fifty-one percent attack like you would That's on a, like a, a public chain. Yeah. So, yeah, not that there, someone chains. might find a reason to try and. You know, That's a valid question, though, for these, for like music coin, yeah. for example, where you know a lot of these are being implemented somewhat publicly. Um, you would have yeah. the capability to try well, to do couldn't, something. Couldn't and this. Um, Sorry if I'm talking too much. No, it's fine. Um, what if you had like basic what amounts to um, like verifiers? Like you to tokenize a song, mm -hmm. and then you get I don't know ten or a hundred or however many percent ownerships of it, so that each one at a, at a what like a small enough micro enough scale that it's exceedingly difficult to screw up one of those elements of the song. And then it's almost like it's almost like miners like yeah. being incentivized to only input valid transactions. Like you're only exactly. incentivized to exactly. input oh, the valid song. song. You could build something on Augur. Yeah, right. You could. Right. <laughs> sorry, we. Yeah. Sorry to use we, your hands. We can't not geek. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have, you have a that's, that's cool. Yeah, I have a question. Talking about in terms of digital <clears throat> scarcity, do you see that as a marketing opportunity, for instance, saying only 10 people will ever be able to listen to this song, or I will let this be played 2,000 times on a radio station. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the crazy things that I like to think about what, what could happen in the future, and mm -hmm. one of the crazy things I like to think about is what if artists don't put out albums anymore, instead they put out protocols, and their fans have to mine <laughs> the <laughs> album. Oh my wow. goodness. And the, uh, awesome. You own it once you mine every track? Yeah, so oh, let's, let's wow. say we'll just use a small artist like Taylor Swift. Let's say Taylor Swift puts out a protocol and gets her millions of fans to do this. Like maybe the first, I don't know, 10 million minds or listens, it gets to the next level of that protocol. And in that protocol, she could have smart contracts that would have you know concert tickets and all kinds of fun stuff. But if you, and stuff. If you, you could do the scarcity aspect in that, I think really easily if you sort of, I mean, if you do it right, obviously. I mean, yeah. this you, is yeah. obviously something I think particularly when it comes into cross-promoting ticket sales for concerts and things like yeah. that, this gets really compelling because yeah. then yeah. it's like, you know, cryptographically proven that only these 100 winners are <laughs> getting these tickets and they'll mm -hmm. be digitally delivered. Here's yeah. your PDF. Yeah. 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 The ability to reward super fans yeah. with blockchain is just like... Because <laughs> the smart contract, I think... Um, so it, you it, it, you track, I know X person is playing my song this many times. And yeah, so yeah, every yeah. play has a, the listener's ID that I am playing this tune. So that would be yeah. in, in that transaction, is that tune A played by listener B at this time. And then um, a good thing to explain here, <clears throat> folks aren't familiar, is that this smart contract we, we explained earlier, um, this goes way beyond this song was played. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, speaking of collaboration, interoperability, mm -hmm. um, you can have all kinds of different usages attached to this track in the smart contract. It's, it's more than it was played on a streaming platform. You could have another usage allowed for the track that is make a remix of the track. Give me 50% of the royalties or whatever you want to, to mm -hmm. declare there. Um, you know, use this track in a video production. This is my royalty rate. Yeah. yeah. Um, use yeah. one of the instrument tracks from this composition in your remix or your other tune. Like this is yeah. my rate, kind of thing. One like, thing I wanted to follow up real quick with: if you do that sort of protocol and you have all her fans mining this, you could have whoever mines a certain block gets the uh, 
uh, what is it, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Gold like the 100th, you're the 100th, what, you're yeah. the 100th enter, uh, yeah, entry. You get yeah. a golden yeah. ticket. Like, you're our 100th you customer. On, <laughs> you get to go on tour with her or something like that. I mean, yeah, uh, green but, room tickets, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. Easy would it be for the lay person who doesn't? Well, and that's why I say it's one of those, those is, crazy ideas, because I think... It's a little early. <laughs> it's a, it's yeah. a little early for that, but it is something that I, I think all of the crypt, uh, cryptocurrency communities are building. Every, like, uh-huh. Blockchain, everybody. You know, People want to do this in Ethereum. I'm going to leave Bitcoin out of it, because sometimes people in Bitcoin could be a bit maximalist. But um, everybody else seems to be... They want to build something that could do do something like that. I was gonna yeah, I was gonna add that that we've actually seen that happen in the physical world. So I think the most famous example that I can think of is that the Wu Tang Clan sold a one off album. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. So the guy that bought it was a piece of shit, but that's neither here nor there. But the, uh, <laughs> so so it, it would be really interesting that this technology could solve a real. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no. so you can solve a real, uh, can solve a real the, problem the with that. The smart contract could also prove that Bill Murray actually stole it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, a real life example that was just used was the Dodgers. The Dodgers yeah. just oh, yeah. did a um, a bobblehead thing on, I think it was on Ethereum. So oh, neat. Our, yeah, our team, I heard about that one. It was following that pretty closely. Yeah, and, th- and th- this is also an area where there's a lot of work being done. Like we have a, we have designers and blockchain meetup happening here in Seattle. And I think it's the first one in the world that I know of where people are, are actively getting together, finding ways to better design these systems for humans, not for for coders and stuff. Because uh, yeah. currently most of the systems are designed for people who really understand the tech at a deep level. But more and more we get into the point that these are usable by anybody. And, and I think it, it won't be very many years before any anybody's grandmother can pull up her phone and uh, and download one of these apps and be using cryptocurrencies and blockchain without having to know she's doing like my, my grandmother uses Facebook all the time she has no idea how uh, how the internet protocol works what and how, PHP is and like, what, yeah. what PHP <laughs> is and PCP. yeah she, she doesn't know what a J, like JPEG she's like oh is that that little broken thing like no that that's only when it doesn't come through it looks like that you know she doesn't have to know how those things work and we're we're slowly moving to that point um, and so with with mining these albums for example. We'll be at a point in a handful of years, I'm, I'm hoping, where you literally just download this app to your phone. You say, hey, let it run in the background on my phone, yeah. and it's mining for you. You don't have to know how it's doing it, why it's doing it. All you know is that you're getting closer to meeting Taylor Swift. So, And that's definitely worth having an app running on your phone 24 hours a day for. So, yeah. But that's what we need to build right now. Yeah, that's, that's where we're at, right? Yep. How yeah. far away do you think that is? <laughs> I mean, oh, no, I don't <laughs> it, it's it's tough because these systems aren't all even like the core systems we need to make it worth having a mining app that you put on your phone that gets you closer to Taylor Swift don't even exist yet, or at least they're not they're in a very nascent stage, I, I should say. Um, and so it's like we've just got to build more stuff at this point. Like this is like a lot of people compare the blockchain world to where the internet was in like the early '90s, mm-hmm. yeah, where like. We know there's this really cool thing. We know we can do cool stuff with One day it. We'll do this really we cool don't stuff. know what that stuff is yet. Like I mean, I was I was still when I was in college in the early 2000s. I was getting surveys uh, that were like, "Would you ever use the internet to buy something?" Like <laughs> right. it's like people weren't even sure. You know, then like, can you even buy things on this? And now, like I mean, look at Amazon. It's yeah. taking over Seattle, and that was an Physically idea that we didn't even know could act like actually work on this platform. So. We got to build stuff and see what see what works, but we'll, we'll get there. I think uh, a good a counterpoint or a good example here is mm-hmm. that um, this is back in 2014. They were pretty early. 2015, the Yujo launch, the, the yep. initial Yujo launch. Yeah. There yeah. was a service called Yujo. Well, they're still out. They just they have a new beta up right now, and they're taking yes. artists. Yujo Music was probably the first and biggest mover in this blockchain for music space. They were the first project to really go all in with the <clears throat> Ethereum based. Uh, platform and create a service that would stream a song and accept payment from the user for that song. The downside was that they tried that in 2015 Mm -hmm. when just getting an Ethereum wallet and knowing how to have any Ethereum, let alone send it to them to get your song, was not easy for the lay person. (laughs) Uh, So I think they infamously made something like $250. on um, oh, that man. initial launch, <laughs> oh, uh, that they were yes. able to actually get in revenue from that. So it's yeah, timing is going to be everything because 
the peripheral tools and the ease of use have a long way to go. And I think that, that UX problem is definitely a pressing challenge right now. I, I think it's yeah. probably the biggest challenge plaguing the industry at the moment. Blockchain is the, as a whole, right? Yeah, is the user it's... experience problem. Because the, you know, the people have sort of figured out the internet. I, I will say that the crypto and blockchain space, in my mind, is a little bit more complicated when it comes to figuring out how all this stuff works. Yeah. Um, that'll change, you know. Um, Steve Jobs famously said that death will sort of help with that as new people kind of come up, we'll be able to get, it'll just be something that's taught and it's natural. But until that point, there's definitely a user experience problem. So it's great that we have like the designer, the de designers of blockchain group where they can make this so it's just a better user experience and they don't even have to know that blockchain or crypto is kind of going on behind the scenes. I think that's going to be a great world because um, we can get all the value, but people don't have to jump through hoops to be able to make $250 with the Nujo experience, for example. So. I think when browsers make payments easy that mm. will happen yeah. like if you use metamask with ethereum it can be kind of a cluster yeah like yeah if it breaks <laughs> you want to throw your computer um and then quickly recover the hard drive yeah you <laughs> have the key stored on it yeah right <laughs> uh, I, know the, I know the brave browser is working on something yeah. like that and i'm really patiently waiting for how brave will sort of build out these types of things yeah so, yeah, with the Yijo beta today, you still have to install MetaMask yeah. if you're an artist yeah. trying to have a track on there and get your payments and stuff. So it's yeah, even even then, it's an extra tool, right? Right. It's like when we have when we don't even have that extra tool, I think that's when it'll really take off. Right. Should we talk about a few more of the platforms that currently exist and what they're kind of specializing in, in doing? Yeah. So there are some really interesting projects that exist today. Um, this would be a good thing to talk about on our way out. We got ten minutes. Yeah. Um, uh, so. As I said earlier, you know, a lot of the major players aren't really going to jump on board with this right away. So it's it's kind of up to the enthusiasts, the developer, developer musicians, the the artistic, you know, media related uh, uh, tech types, to create these projects and kind of demonstrate that they have value. So um, Yujo was probably the biggest first mover. Uh, they've got like the most marketed name out there right now. But I think my number two right now is something called Musicoin. I've got some tracks up there too. Um, so what they've decided to do is just stand up their own service and their own token called music and to just go for it and try to be the new music token. Um, they are building an ecosystem that eventually will hopefully be able to do ticket sales and merch and all this nice. other stuff and just have music token be your music ecosystem currency. Um, what's interesting about them is they have a universal basic income model built into their mining that may or may not work out in the long run, I have my doubts. Um, but what they're doing is that they have mining going on and a, a portion of the tokens mined are reserved in the pool. And that pool is used to pay artists per play at sort of a controlled rate to kind of handle volatility uh, when you're getting paid as an artist. And then the rest of those tokens you know, are just going out onto the, onto the network uh, generally. And um, listeners actually don't pay per stream on that platform. Your pay per that stream comes out of the UBI pool and artists are, or listeners are incentivized to tip you in token mm -hmm. in the tip jar when they listen to your stuff yeah. on top of what you're getting from the UBI. So I thought that was a really interesting model. That's awesome. Well, Tune does some kind of similar thing. Where Tune is another uh, platform that it also has its own token it's the called other big the one right now. yeah, yeah it's called the yeah. the notes uh, is the token that they have. Yeah, they're yeah. they're built on Ethereum, so they're also ERC twenty token. Um, and that platform uh, has, has a similar feature where no one currently, at least, uh, as a listener, is paying anything yet. The, all the new coins minted into that ecosystem are minted through plays, and then those coins are delivered to the artists yeah. based on, I, I don't know if it's, it, it seems like it must be a percentage of a total number of coins per day because I'll have the same number of plays back to back, and I'll have a different amount of coins that I receive. Um, I do have some albums on tune, so I've been seeing how it works and testing it out. One feature that I like that they've implemented that I think we're going to see uh, will become ubiquitous amongst any of these platforms is uh, uh, playlist curators are also yeah, paid for uh, for putting songs into a playlist. And as the artist, you determine how much how much of a percentage of your uh, your tokens you receive for the song go to the playlist curator. So if you're a young up and coming artist who don't have a big audience yet, you might say, "I'll give you fifty percent. Just put my put my tracks in all of your playlists." And as you start getting your own audience, you might slowly decrease the amount that goes into curated playlists as your popularity becomes higher. Your own place, yeah. yeah, it's like it's like a total total market mechanism that determines how much you are giving to playlist curators. So that way, anybody, including fans, can get paid 
to be interacting with music and, and creating playlists. Providing and, value and creating yeah. useful playlists that people find value in. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. like influencer marketing meets music playlists. Right. It's yeah. cool. all systematized and contractized. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, and it's all built into the smart contract. There's another project called Audius right now that does a similar kickback thing for resharing other tracks, like playlist, curated playlist yeah, pieces. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I think that's going to be a popular thing. I think that is definitely going to be a po uh, popular component. Oh, yeah, totally. Because um, it's on two of the major projects right now, and yeah. I, I only see it growing. Is there any solution that's solving for like the composer? I stepped out for the minute, but the, if you're the in the studio the first time and it's your music and you record it, it goes in. It, does that portion of the ecosystem have any tools related to it in terms of getting onto the contracts or the payment schedule? You mean at the com at the composition level? Composition or for or the musical work or mastering level? Well, the way that it works now is that the, it's basically on the master. It's like that track yeah. as recorded is the asset that's being managed. Um, I think there's an opportunity, and I'm sure there are projects that exist that I don't know about, uh, on the publishing side specifically to handle that composition as an entity and put that on some kind of chain with the unique. Uh, Ours does. The one that we're building oh, hey. is, is doing it. So we can, yeah. we can, we can chat at some point. Good boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so I think that's the other side of it, right? There's the master, and then the composition is going to need all this same shepherding and management and, and coaxing through the systems and tracking, right? Tagging and. Yeah, we we don't have our we we don't have a way to show our our slide deck, but in it we actually had a couple slides that show like how this process actually looks and the number of players involved. And we have like a simplified slide where it's like, oh, there's like ten little moving parts here, and then we show the real slide of how it works, and it's like a hundred bubbles with all these cross X's and O's and stuff. How this works, it's, it's, a it's really it's, it's, a it's way more complicated yeah. than it needs to. Be. Uh, so I've uploaded the slide deck actually to the event. If you just go oh, to the event, sick. yeah, I put the PPTX up on there. If you want to go check out the slide deck, you can download a copy. Yeah. Do you um, want to save time for questions, like five minutes less? Yeah, we can do a little Q&A, but we'll open it up for full Q&A now if anyone has any other questions. Or we'll just keep geeking out up here. <laughs> yeah, we'll just keep talking acronyms for another five right. minutes. Yeah, my go. Um, so one thing I'm really curious about is infrastructure, specific like physical infrastructure, which is based, Seattle has the problem, um, countries around the world do. I'm talking mm -hmm. with the mayors of a few different cities about this. Because music cities are like this this word that people mm -hmm. are throwing out mm -hmm. now. And one of the main problems that I run up against is everybody talks about music and streaming and listening to stuff and all this great all these great things that are kind of the result of music and production. However, there is very little infrastructure for production. Right? Where are the practice spaces? Where are the venues? Where are the bookers? Right? Mm -hmm. How much are you charging? How much organization do you have together? And I'm curious if down the line, streaming is certainly part of all of this, but kind of in the wider ecosystem, right? Is it, I personally sort of feel like it's a little bit cart before the horse right now with streaming only because the, the means to produce the thing that you want to stream are so limited. And mm -hmm. is there, like, is, is what music and blockchain is doing is kind of like, are you considering that? or in kind of organization versus distribution? I mean, that's, that's rad. I don't know. <laughs> well, so, okay, so we, we're talking about interoperability. I think this right. is a really cool area for that. So uh, if we eventually get to the point that we have a few chains that are working or some universal music coin that everybody sort of agrees upon is the, the thing, or, or some platforms that develop that use a common currency mm -hmm. like Ethereum, um, that you could start having uh, studios and, and publishers and venues and even tour buses and things that all are sort of operating within this ecosystem. Yeah. yeah, all operating within this ecosystem. And so you could, <laughs> you could <laughs> right? And so you, you could you could build into whatever your band or your your act is doing. Like you receive some tokens from here and you can automatically shepherd it off to the studio that you're gonna be visiting on this tour to record this one track as you do your world thing and then you get paid from this venue in the tokens and then you <laughs> pay your tour bus driver in the tokens and it could be this kind of uh, ecosystem that utilizes uh, utilizes some sort of token model or some or maybe a small set of tokens that are interoperable and translate easily. Yeah, to totally. Like yeah, that where, you know, yeah. That's a good. That's but yeah, you know, awesome though. I don't know. It would have to be a scenario where that's still more appealing than using something like dollars, right? Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. Well, that's where globally, I think it that has a lot of appeal. As soon as, soon as you start traversing country borders, mm -hmm. this becomes really valuable because suddenly you don't have to worry about exchange rates. You don't have to go to Is a it, yeah. You don't have to go to a, a, a coin changer at every single airport that you land at with your, your team. You're just doing all these payments with this cryptocurrency that is global, that's borderless. You don't rely upon any country's uh, you know, individual fiat currency to do these transactions. So your bus driver in, you know, in Portugal 
takes your music note thing. Your diner or wherever you're staying, you know, mm -hmm. in, Par in Paris takes your music note thing. The hotel you stay at, the, you know, you start seeing where... So credit cards going to do that, though? I mean, to some extent, you're still paying a conversion fee. You're still paying, you know, transaction fees. You're still relying upon a centralized, uh, you know, like author authority in the middle of all this that that has all your information. And this is where you get people are interested in some of the other benefits of blockchain tech, things like owning all of your own data. Um, then suddenly you're like, well, I don't really, you know, I don't want to operate in the world where J.P. Morgan Chase is controlling all my data and has all my stuff, and there's potential for security breaches and, and fraud and theft. Then suddenly you can build this other world where you're doing this all peer-to-peer. -peer. Again, this is the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of it. You're all interacting with one another and you can build much stronger networks that way, mm -hmm. um, build entire systems around this. And like, I know that, that Kala is doing some interesting right, right. stuff around yeah. developing sort of like music communities and shows. And if you have <clears throat> a musical coin integrated in these ecosystems, it doesn't matter where your customers are flying in from to, be, to go to these shows and these series and things. So. Well, the other thing kind of to your note I can imagine is, and it'd be really complicated, but probably doable, is with just via smart contracts down the line, uh, you can just make a deployable kind of meta smart contract that includes the hotels and the bus driver and the venue and, you know, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So that once you want to go on tour, you just say, oh, I want to go to these the countries. Tour package. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And then it just yeah. goes through instantaneously. You don't have to call a hotel and book. You don't have to find a venue that, that's open on the night that you want to play. You can just say, okay, here's what we're going to do. And suddenly it just goes. Yeah. It's pretty hot. To the network. <laughs> to the network. <laughs> to the network. <laughs> I asked this earlier, but is, is there anything related to the abstraction layer where <clears throat> any party involved could just get the USD out of it or put into it and not have to have the EBG oh. about crypto that's it's common in a, in a B2B? Enterprise scenario. Yeah. 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 There, yeah, there are totally like, is bit, bit yeah, pay is a big one. There's all kinds of intermediaries coming out. There's a bunch of tools that are being built right now, and some that are totally functional, where you pay in USD and then it converts it to crypto and does all that on the chain, and then it converts it back to USD on the recipient. So no one has to know. Is it's that like my grandmother could help Facebook. you deal with the behemoth big corps that don't want to have their treasury deal with crypto? You could just plug it into one of those and say, yeah. Hey, your artist on the contract here. But yeah. Totally. That, I mean, that's Frank. That's our whole yeah. model with what we're building. Is no, there's no crypto component to that would ever be seen by users or by enterprises because they're not. I don't yeah. think they're going to adopt it in the next five or ten years. So you're out to yeah. insulate even the, the company you're talking to from this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a buyer's objection. Right. right. Yeah. Totally. Right. Yeah. And. Yeah. All right. It looks like we're out of awesome. time. Thanks everybody right. for coming. Yeah, thank you. Really good time. Thanks, Thanks Bruce, for setting this up. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce did all the hard work on this. So, give him props. <laughs>